You're now on the historic route. Today, David and Goliath, the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. common element in many a good story is that of the underdog. You know, the small guy standing up to the big guy, the up-and-coming team winning against the previous champions, or maybe the unlikely hero saving the day in our favorite movies. And we really seem to enjoy this story format. I mean, we see it everywhere, from the biblical David and Goliath to the historical American revolutionary versus the British army, to the modern pop culture Rocky or Karate Kid equivalent. These stories usually come with a handful of cliches that we've come to expect. Our underdog protagonist, or how we would think of him today, would be like the new kid on the block. You know, scrawny and smaller than the other tougher kids, but equipped with that certain something. Maybe wit or will that allows him to challenge them. And our antagonist, well, he would be like the tough bully, you know, brawny and meaner with a nasty left hook, but also maybe a little bit slow and perhaps overconfident. And we see these cliches or stereotypes, if you will, playing out all the time in history. I mean, I mentioned the American Revolutionary War before. That probably being the one most people think of when looking for examples of, let's say, historical David and Goliath stories. But there are plenty more throughout history. Think of the Spartans versus the Persians, the Americans versus the Vietnamese, or the Afghans versus the Soviets, you know. There's countless more I won't have the time to get into right now. But the same archetypes play out very similarly in all these examples. The underdog dare stand up against the much more powerful foe. The conclusion of the conflict almost seems foregone. But somehow, you know, somehow the underdog pulls out a victory. Overconfidence, miscalculation, superior leadership, morale, newer, better technology, or maybe even sheer luck, all may factor in. But we all recognize a good David and Goliath story when we see one, don't we? So, for today's history, I have maybe the quintessential underdog story, complete with, let's say, all the bells and whistles we might wish for in a story such as this. In 1905, a war will break out that will go on to define and in a lot of ways foreshadow events to come in much of the early 20th century. And it also just so happens to be a supremely fascinating story as well. I present to you the Russo-Japanese War. I'd like to start off by introducing you to our two contenders, our David and Goliath, if I'm going to continue rolling with this metaphor. So in the first corner we have Russia, the bear, our Goliath. Now Russia's history in the 19th century and leading up until 1905 is complex and multifaceted to say the least, so I will attempt to provide enough context without overflooding you with too much info. Russia 
Now, the Russian Tsardom had firmly established itself as a global power by the 19th century. It was by far the largest of the continental European powers, large in the sense of land mass, population, and resources. Now, this did not mean that Russia was unchallenged. The loss of the Crimean War in the middle of the 19th century exposed to many that some cracks were showing in the seemingly untouchable image of the Russian Empire. Especially the lack of modernization seemed apparent. Not only was Russia significantly slower to embrace mass industrialization, the laying of railroads and the expansion of infrastructure more general, but they also severely fell behind in the updating, let's say, of their armed forces. Think tactics, equipment, and logistics, for example. But in some ways, you can't blame them for not putting in that much effort to catch up. You see, the old ways had worked before. The numbers game had provided Russia with an undeniable advantage for a long time. The enemy has 10,000 crack troops. Well, we have 100,000 troops. So it doesn't really matter how great your troops are. A certain Corsican emperor tries to invade? Well, let's see him try to conquer all 9.15 million square miles of land. You get my point. Things changed, though. The explosion of ideas and inventions in the 19th century meant that disadvantage started to count for less and less as time went on. Let's take the example from before. If my guys number 100,000 and your guys number 10,000, but you have machine guns and modern artillery, and my guys have barely mastered the musket, well, my guys might as well be carrying sticks. Look no further than accounts of World War I to see how much of a difference these new technologies really made. Yes, still somewhat a extreme colorization of my point, but not entirely without merit, I think. And especially we modern people can easily see the overpowering advantages of superior technology. But not so long ago, this was not taken for granted at all. Maybe because up until now it hadn't been such a massive gap. But anyway, back to Russia. For the remainder of the 19th century, Russia's trajectory was undoubtedly upwards. Inroads into Central Asia and the Caucasus were all successful, as were their plans for China. They had negotiated a series of unequal treaties with the Chinese, leaving them in control of vast swaths of land in southeast Siberia, down to the new jewel of the east, Vladivostok. Now China or to be more exact, the Qing Empire's place in the world at this point will be pivotal to the story later. So let's pause the strain of thought for now and I will come back to them at a later point. Just remember that Russia is slowly moving into China and shows no signs of stopping. But first, we need to introduce our underdog, our David. Japan, the empire of the rising sun. Now, Japan's political scene, up until the 1860s, consisted of many local lords, a figurehead emperor, and a shogun in charge of things. Think of it this way. Imagine the emperor as like a British monarch of today, representing the country and being the figurehead of the country, but not really handling the day-to-day -day business. Whereas the shogun can be imagined as maybe a, a prime minister or a chancellor of any number of countries today, in charge of the country, but not the person you send to festivities. So these shoguns instituted a policy of isolation in Japan that lasted for centuries, effectively barring most of the outside world to Japan, limiting the flow of technology and ideas, all while emerging European colonial powers with their advances in technology were seizing up the Asian continent. This all came to a head in 1868, when a civil war restored the emperor as head of government. So the prime minister is now also the chancellor. And he united the decentralized Japan into one unified state, looking to modernize itself and to leave its mark on the world. What followed can only be described as a sheer miracle. In the span of not even 40 years, Japan will have transformed itself from insignificant feudal backwater to regional powerhouse with a burgeoning industry, modern military, 
and state-of-the-art fleet. Not only did they adapt Western ideas and technologies quicker than, well, some Western nations even, in fact, they also managed to combine their Eastern philosophy and Western ideas and way of life into a potent cultural mix. Think absolute monarchy infused with a heavy dose of nationalism, religious zeal, and extreme dedication and industriousness. A working symbiosis between ancient Eastern feudal ideas and modern Western influences. Unique, to say the least. And if I'm to be honest, almost unseen before in history. In an overdone and sensationalized way, that is, as if in some alternate reality, after Columbus and other Europeans had discovered America, the native population had just adapted the European ways and technologies, and had formed their own maritime kingdoms and empires. Just imagine that. A Sioux Empire, or an Iroquois Empire, colonizing, nation-building, and you know, just generally imitating Western nations. Quite ridiculous to think about, if not a little bit fascinating. Of course, this example is not to be taken as a valid historical comparison, but it does get the point across on how out of the world this transformation truly was. All in all, these chain of events are described today as the Magi Restoration, named after the Emperor Magi who ruled in this time. Him being the guy that won the Civil War, that unified the country, and the guy who would lead it, up to and including this war we will be talking about. Soon, the empire of the rising sun's gaze will be directed outwards, as Japan's naturally resource-scarce island soon couldn't fulfill all of the new nation's many needs and ambitions. So the plotting began. Not only would Japan, like its western peers, join in on the colonizing game, but they would want to excel at it, be better than the rest at it, they saw the world as dog-eat-dog, -dog, and they were going to play the part of Alpha Dog in this region of the globe. A line of advantage was to be set up. Imagine this like a soft border. Japan would wield large amounts of influence in the region and would be able to extend its imperial reach beyond its borders, influencing eternal politics, getting good deals on native resources, and of course, setting up military bases but they wouldn't outright annex it. Now the first, let's say, target for their new line of advantage comes as no surprise if one is to look at a map of the region. It is, of course, China. So it seems about time I introduce China, our future object of contention, our battleground, if you will. Now, any attempts to summarize Chinese history in the outgoing 19th century and up to this point would not only be a whole podcast in and of itself, but maybe even two or three podcasts. So, I will provide the most important facts pertinent to the story, again, while trying not to overload you with facts. In the outgoing 19th and early 20th century, China had been ruled by the Qing dynasty for quite a while now although their rule had been, let's say, tenuous at the least, leading up to 1905. Multiple rebellions, uprisings, and wars against European powers had left the Middle Kingdom somewhat waning in its former brilliance. This weakness was no secret to Asia's new power, Japan. Like a shark smelling blood. A rise in tensions and a political game of influence played out in the Chinese vassal state of Korea which directly led to the First Sino-Japanese War. The First Sino-Japanese War, a war in which Japan handily won and managed to capture Korea and large swaths of Manchuria. Manchuria is the most northwestern part of modern-day China. Now this war has many, let's say, features that might be described as foreshadowing for things to come a overconfident and unwilling to change China had its armies beat multiple times by the ascendant Japanese. You see, China had pretty much gone the opposite route of Japan and had been mostly resistant in adapting anything Western. Modern technology and firepower proved to be far superior to sheer manpower alone. 
maybe even more on the nose, a fateful naval encounter, the Battle of the Yalu River, where Chinese forces were resoundingly defeated, showed the Japanese Navy to be a swift and efficient maritime power, something we will be seeing again very soon. In my introduction of Japan, I mentioned their unique cultural makeup. Well, in this war, we get to see it in action. A firm grasp of the latest technology led Japan to victory in battle after battle, and a will to win that outsiders would soon come to describe as almost fanatical, almost medieval, lent them a drive not seen in some time. This is the fusion of worlds I talked about before. Modern weapons, but ancient warrior morale. Here's what I mean. The following is a quote by a Japanese soldier was part of a battle. Modern historians and even a lot of contemporary historians would point out that this was more of a massacre than a battle. Anyway, this battle, the Siege of Port Arthur. And I'll say right now, remember that name. It's going to feature a couple more times in this story. Nevertheless, a Japanese contingent was sent to take this strategic Chinese city of Port Arthur. Here's a diary account of this soldier involved in this siege. As we entered the town of Port Arthur, we saw the head of a Japanese soldier displayed on a wooden stake. This filled us with rage and a desire to crush any Chinese soldier. Anyone we saw in the town, we killed. The streets were filled with corpses. So many, they blocked our way. We killed people in their homes. By and large, there wasn't a single house was out from three to six dead. Blood was flowing, and the smell was awful. We sent out search parties. We shot some, hacked at others. The Chinese troops just dropped their arms and fled, firing and slashing. It was unbounded joy. At this time, our artillery troops were in the rear, giving three cheers. Banzai, 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 for the emperor. Wow. Unbounded joy. This seems more like an account you would read from a Mongolian soldier, maybe, after sacking a medieval European city. Not something that happens in the, quotation marks, civilized societies of the 19th century. Then again, this would become the norm once again, not too distant in the future. Some more foreshadowing, maybe. Nevertheless, Japanese zeal and power had been proven but the outside world would neither recognize nor allow this. After defeating the Chinese, a peace deal was brokered between the belligerents. The Japanese were now masters of Korea and headed firmly in their sphere of influence, if not yet totally annexed. They were, however, not granted their significant gains made in Manchuria. In the interest of a balance of powers, the Western superpowers, in this case France, Germany, but primarily Russia, decreed that these lands be returned back to China. In the eyes of the Japanese, Japan had just been denied their right of conquest, and they wouldn't soon forget it. But Japan was not the only power interested in Chinese lands, specifically Manchuria. Now, we had already briefly talked about Russia's previous forays into Qing China, leaving them most significantly in control of Vladivostok and a good stretch of coast next to the Pacific. But there was one problem. And for Russia in particular, this was a huge problem. So huge, in fact, that it would not be crazy to state that most of Russia's foreign policy at the time centered around this one problem. Warm water ports. Oh, how they coveted those warm water ports. You see, Russia may be endowed with an abundance of resources, manpower, and land, but they're always lacking in the naval department when it came to affairs of empire. You see, Russia did have many ports, but most of them were far to the north, where they froze over in the winter, severely limiting the operational scope of the Russian navy. And everybody knew the navy was the secret to success. And you can see this desire to move south in various ways, primarily in early expansion along the Caucasus, and later wars fought for Central Asia in hopes of reaching the Indian Ocean. 
and of course they move east and southeast to China. Warm water ports, pretty big deal. After Japan had to give up its possessions in Manchuria, Russia stepped in. Wishing to finally achieve their goal of having a warm water port, the Russians officially leased a nice way of saying politically browbeat the Chinese into signing over the port of, yes, you guessed it, Port Arthur. I told you the city is going to be important. Along with this lease, Manchuria was now firmly in the Russian sphere of influence. A collision between Russia and Japan seems inevitable now. Let's take a step back now, and let's try to take a look at the situation from a bird's eye view. Japan and Russia, David and Goliath, they are both heading towards confrontation. Influence in Manchuria is the linchpin of the situation. Neither power wants to back down. Seems straightforward. But there's one aspect to this war I have not mentioned yet. The British. Because of course the British are involved. The sun is far from setting on the British Empire at this time. Quite the opposite. It's at its zenith. So it comes as no surprise that they would also play a part in this. If not, an entirely obvious one. A part that is, in my opinion, often overlooked. You see, the British may dislike, even downright hate, the French at this point in history. Well, any point of history if you ask some Englishman even now. But they have another, almost mortal enemy at the time. Russia. You see, I before had mentioned Russia's incursions into Central Asia and their wish to reach the Indian Ocean. Well, that did not sit too well with Britain at all. You see, the crown jewel India was top priority for England. So any threat to it was not taken lightly. And so the great game was played. Now the great game definitely deserves its own podcast episode. But in short, it's Russia and Britain's attempt to secure as much land in Central Asia as quickly as possible, while blocking the other in any way possible. Imagine it like real-life chess. Now this created a sort of balance of power in the region. But this was all threatened, though when the British started making new inroads into China, markedly taking over the port of Wei Haiwei in 1897. Russia countered by taking over Port Arthur. So in actuality, they are effectively angering not only the Japanese, but also the British. And you know how the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy? Well, an Anglo-Japanese alliance was hammered out in 1902 guaranteeing British non-involvement in aggressive wars and aid in defensive wars. What does this mean in practical terms? Well, should Japan just so happen to find itself in a war with Russia, Britain would stay out of it. And if Russia's ally France deemed it prudent enough to intervene on the Tsar's behalf, well then Britain would be happy to step in and help Japan. Carte blanche for the Japanese. Although when the time would come for war in 1905, France would have no appetite for it effectively removing these two players from the board. But do not mistake their non, let's say, direct involvement for a lack of interest. I think of it more as a genius chess move of Britain, almost like a proxy war in a sense, like the ones we would see in the Cold War. And if you're familiar with the biblical story we've been comparing our two players to, David and Goliath, it almost seems at times that Britain plays Saul in this tale, not willing to fight Russia, its biggest nemesis in these parts, so he sets up David, or Japan, out to do his dirty work. Definitely one way of looking at it. What is for sure, though, is that England is playing the long game everywhere at once. I mean, of course, these calculations would turn out disastrously wrong come World War II, but for now they're friends, and that's a story for another time. Let's return back to our protagonists, Japan and Russia. David and Goliath have now assembled at the proverbial battlefield, and much like in the biblical story, a sort of standoff ensues. Conflict seems unstoppable now, but Goliath is not worried. In Russia's eyes, Japan is inferior in many ways. You see, the early 20th century was the high point in what we today would call pseudoscientific racism. They saw the Japanese as nothing more than, and I quote here, yellow monkeys. Surely no Asian, pagan, and uncivilized upstart could beat the might of the likes of Russia. This racist attitude towards other peoples went so far that 
shortly before the outbreak of war, when some elements in both sides of the conflict wanted to resolve things, that the Japanese envoy sent to St. Petersburg to negotiate with the Russian government had to endure disrespect, mockery, and was all in all treated as a lesser being within the Russian court. He wasn't even allowed to speak to certain people for fears he might sully the Russian court nobles. Now, this racist and, let's say, Euro or white supremacist attitude is, of course, inexcusable and plainly just wrong. But, in some ways, their confidence or overconfidence seems understandable. I mean, a European power has not lost to a non-European power in centuries. And it has not even been close. I am sure many of you are aware about how easily European nations took over large parts of the Earth. In some ways, you can almost see them as aliens swooping down on Earth today with lasers and spaceships, as in some 50s science fiction movie, and Earth doesn't stand a chance. The technological gap is too large. But... What if Earth starts using those alien lasers against the invaders? Well, Japan would not come unprepared to this battle. They had time. Not a lot of time. But like we said, they miraculously managed to catch up and in some ways even improve upon Western ideas and technologies. And they prepare for war. Now one of these alien lasers that will be directed back at the Russians maybe the defining arm of the Japanese armed forces will be their navy, the Japanese navy. To return to our David and Goliath metaphor, this is David's slingshot, and this slingshot will be devastating, and like in the biblical story, it would decide the war, coming out of seemingly nowhere to decide the outcome of the battle. Now, when Japan had, let's say, awoken from its feudal slumber, the first priority of the new imperial government was to wholly construct a state from scratch. Many eastern ideas and ways of life stayed, of course, or were slightly altered to fit the new order, but many deemed not practical enough were simply discarded. Of course, many a new idea from the west would be needed to complete their societal structure. What followed was a buffet style of nation building. What do I mean by that? So Japan sent out envoys to all of the major powers and simply went shopping for ideas. They looked around and asked themselves, who does what well? Seems pretty smart to me. So they saw the Germans and thought, amazing army, let's adopt that. They saw the Dutch and Swedish and thought, amazing industry and engineering concepts, let's adopt that. And so on and so on. But most importantly, they saw the British and their seemingly invincible navy, and they knew they wanted that. So now you can start to see which ingredients make up this Japanese war machine. The best the West has to offer, combined with a certain something that Japanese society just seems to have, zeal, prowess, maybe plain fanaticism. This potent concoction will prove to be fatal to Japan's enemies. And this is most exemplified by their navy, who we will shortly be seeing doing the heavy lifting in the coming war of 1905 by delivering not only a blow to Russia, but such a devastating blow that Russia, the bear, or Goliath, will get knocked out clean by shortly, I unfortunately do actually mean next episode, in which we will finally get to the actual war this story is about. So, I bid you to stay tuned for next time on the historic route.